Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Harm Reduction Policy and Practice, brought to you by the Network for Public Health Law and the American Society of Law, Medicine, and Ethics. I'm Charles Strong, the Digital Marketing Coordinator at the Network's National Office, and I'll be your host for today's webinar. A quick note that both the presentation slides and video playback for this webinar will be available on our website shortly after the conclusion of this event. We strongly encourage attendee participation and would love to hear from you, so feel free to submit your questions at any time during this webinar by using the Q&A tab on the right-hand side of your screen. All you need to do is click on that tab, select all panelists from the drop-down menu, and submit your question. We will be addressing questions at the end of the event. Your moderator for today's webinar is Corey Davis. Corey is a nationally recognized expert on harm reduction law and policy and serves as the director of the Harm Reduction Legal Project, where he works to address legal and policy barriers that impede the establishment and expansion of harm reduction measures. Corey also serves as the deputy director of the network's Southeastern Region Office, where he provides legal technical assistance on a variety of public health topics. His current work focuses on overdose prevention, health equity, alcohol and drug abuse prevention, and the Affordable Care Act. Corey will be leading us through the rest of today's webinar. So Corey, over to you. Great, thanks Charles. So we have a great webinar for you today. And I'm first going to very briefly introduce our, our three presenters, uh, three panelists, and then just turn it over, uh, you know, give a, a very brief overview of what we do here at the Harm Reduction Legal Project and Harm Reduction in general, and then turn it over to, to the presenters. And, and how we're going to do this is um, we're going to have the three presenters go in order. If you have any questions um, while you're listening to them, please feel free to throw them in the um, in the Q&A that's on the right side of your screen. But we're going to hold them until the end. Uh, each of the presenters will go for 20 minutes, give or take, and then we we'll, should have plenty of time at the end for your questions. But if you want to throw them in there while you're thinking of them so you don't forget them, feel free to uh, just type them in that, in that chat box. So first we're going to have um, Elizabeth Oliver. Uh, Dr. Oliver is the National Opioid Overdose Education and Naloxone Distribution Coordinator uh, at the Veterans Health Administration. She also holds uh, research roles. Um, and she is, uh, you know, very interested in trying to reduce the harms associated um, with drug use among uh, veterans uh, that are um, accessing care at the Veterans Health Administration. After that, we're going to have uh, Brad Ray. Uh, Dr. Ray is an associate professor and a, a newly appointed director for the Center for Behavioral Health and Justice at, at Wayne State. And he's going to talk about some really interesting community-based um, research um, that he's been doing to try to, among other things, let people have a better sense of what is in the drugs um, that they are taking. And finally, we've got um, Maureen O'Reilly, uh, who is a staff attorney at Vermont Legal Aid. And she's going to talk about a really interesting uh, sort of take on the medical legal partnership, meeting people where they're at, by embedding attorneys into um, substance use disorder treatment programs and needle exchange programs uh, in Vermont. So I'm really excited uh, to hear from all of these presenters. So I want to give you a, a really quick plug. We have just launched in the last few months something we're calling the Harm Reduction Legal Project here at the network. And, you know, the idea behind this is that there are you know, so many barriers to uh, people finding out what, you know, what the evidence says about various laws and policies um, impacting people who use drugs, uh, that are barriers to people who use drugs from accessing services, and just our kind of design. You know, unfortunately, drug policy in the United States is still kind of designed to treat um, uh, people with, uh, you know, problematic relationships with drugs uh, as criminals, as, as sort of bad people. And the law, unfortunately, reflects that in a lot of ways. So, you know, our goal here is to work uh, with people who use drugs, people who are, uh, you know, running and affiliated with organizations um, that uh, work with people who use drugs, both governmental and non-governmental, 
to try to reduce those barriers, help people navigate um, that system. We are here. Um, we, our services are free. Um, you can email us at harmreduction at networkforphl.org. We're also on, uh, on Twitter um, at Harm Reduction Legal. So if you have any questions, if you think we can help you, if you're not sure if we can help you, if you just um, want, you know, want to reach out, please don't hesitate to do that. We're very happy to, to talk to um, pretty much anybody, as long as your goal is to um, improve the lives um, of people who are using drugs. Uh, you know, we, we want to help you do that. So just really quickly, you know, we're going to have um, another webinar in the spring that's going to, um, you know, talk about sort of the intersection of harm reduction and the law more specifically um, in more detail. But I just wanted to, you know, really quickly talk about, you know, what we think about when we're talking about, about harm reduction and, and really, you know, what we're, you know, the idea behind harm reduction is, is sort of meeting people where they're at, not uh, coming to people and telling them, here is, you know, what we think you should be doing, but asking people, where would you like to be? Um, you know, how are you, you know, how, you know, you're trying to move forward in what ways and how can we help you um, do that? You know, so it's a, uh, it's a sort of philosophy, it's an idea. Um, that respects the health and dignity of people who are using drugs, that, you know, takes seriously um, the needs and wants and desires um, of people who are using drugs, and, uh, you know, has as it, you know, recognizes that, the, the, you know, the drug law and policy in the United States as, as elsewhere um, is, you know, inherently racist, is inherently inequitable, and works to try to um, address that. And, you know, I think it's really kind of well suited to, to law in a lot of ways in that, you know, lawyers and, and policy folks, you know, we, we tend to be pragmatists, you know, and, and harm reduction recognizes that and kind of says, okay, how do we, how do we move forward? You know, um, how, do we, how do we change things? How do we work with a new system? Um, you know, we're going to hear today from three um, presenters who are kind of talking in different ways about um, either you know, increasing access to legal services in the, in the sense of Merade or, or to drug checking or to naloxone. And, and that is, um, you know, that is harm reduction, right? Um, you know, as, as Daniel Raymond um, for Harm Reduction Coalition here says, you know, if you're handing out syringes in naloxone, you're, you're doing a good thing. Um, you know, but, but harm reduction is more than that, really. It is, you know, is that way of thinking about, is that way of interacting with, it's that way of, you know, valuing um, and respecting the people that, um, that we're working with and working to help, you know, people help themselves um, in that sense, you know, not to, not to parachute in and say, we can solve all of your problems, but, but to, um, you know, help people who want to, you know, who, who want to do a certain thing, you know, uh, do that thing better. Um, so anyway, I will, I will stop there. Like I said, a very uh, brief uh, introduction to, to, you know, what I see as the um, intersection between harm reduction and law and policy. Look for a, a webinar in the spring that's going to um, go much more deeply into that um, and have, you know, a lot more input from people who are, who are directly um, impacted. But with that, um, I am really uh, proud and happy to turn it over uh, to Dr. Oliva, who is going to talk about this really fantastic scale up of naloxone distribution um, within the Veterans Health Administration. So uh, Dr. Oliva, i turn it over to you. So uh, thanks again for inviting me to present. I am um, going to go through, I actually have 30 slides, 20 minutes, so it's going to be a little bit of whirlwind, but it's more to give you just a sense of the types of things we're doing within VA with regards to naloxone. And I know that um, Corey was particularly interested in me highlighting some of the um, policy and um, 
uh, other sorts of things we had to do to stand up the program. So there's just a lot of people that were involved in standing up the program. You can see um, Corey's mentioned on this slide as well. Uh, so it really does take a village, and we've really been lucky to engage lots of people. Um, I think it's not that hard given how uh, this is a life-saving intervention, um, but there is a lot that kind of went into um, standing up the program. So whenever I talk about OE&D, I always break it up into two different um, sections because I think a lot of people just think about the ND part, the naloxone distribution, but I think it really um, does not capture the potential power of the intervention broadly, which is really training patients on how to prevent um, an overdose. And, and there's a lot of data that basically suggests a lot, of, uh, a lot of individuals don't know what puts them at risk of overdose. And so, again, you can keep giving those people naloxone and they may continue overdosing without actually thinking about ways in which they might be able to prevent it from happening to begin with. So um, in VA, we have two target patient populations, and it's one of many things we do to try to keep patients safe. So we have patients with OUD and patients prescribed opioids. And based on the great work out of our community partners, we have tailored education and everything we've done around these two patient populations, which um, can be seen and, and different strategies may be needed for them um, to ensure that they get what they need. Next slide is basically just a screenshot of um, what VA is doing broadly to address the opioid where we had a really nice um, viewpoint paper from our then acting secretary, or our then secretary um, on how we're addressing this. The next slide shows the National VA OEND program publication. So if any of you are interested, we've published a paper that basically talks about all the things we did to really establish our program. And so some of the major things we did were we have um, policy and clinical guidance that we've developed, um, educational resources, implementation and evaluation resources, and this was really a pharmacy driven. I think when you're talking about a healthcare based initiative, um, you really need to make sure, given that it's medication, that this is pharmacy driven, um, that you have those folks involved. And so the next slide essentially um, gets at some of the policy and clinical guidance that we've developed to help with this. And so um, from the get-go, we knew that um, we needed leadership support. So in 2014, I think it's interesting, I'm not sure how many of you are in this area per se, but um, early on, I think until Eliza Wheeler's landmark study in 2012 and the CDC at MMWR, there were really a lot of places doing this. And again, it was mostly targeting um, individuals in community-based programs. And so um, to kind of translate that to a healthcare-based setting, uh, we had an undersecretary for health information letter that came out basically um, encouraging VA providers to, to provide OE&D um, to veterans at risk of overdose. Um, we also knew that if you have this, you need to make sure people are able to order it. And again, if, uh, for those of you who aren't in this, there was no place where you could actually go and just order naloxone. Right now, you know, we have Evzio and we have Narcan. Um, we have Evzio auto injector and Narcan nasal spray. And so you can order those um, from any vent, you know, from, from vendors. But back then, you know, community-based programs and, and the people we're looking at, they were hand assembling. And even still, they still have um, assembly parties um, to get all of these things assembled because um, a number of places aren't necessarily still using the um, FDA-approved layperson formulations that I mentioned and are still assembling um, vials and, and uh, injection, inject, uh, injection um, IM uh, naloxone. So back then, though, we had to figure out ways to standardize and distribute this. And so um, VA at that point uh, added these layperson formulations to the national drug file and the um, consolidated male outpatient pharmacy literally had a you know people there who are assembling these for national distribution. The other thing we noted um, um, is cost, right? Costs can come into play. And so we wanted to make sure from the outset of this that people did not were not concerned about cost. And so um, we had this Rita Facilities Naloxone Initiative that provided um, funding so that any um, provider could order it and there was no cost to their facility. So if they were thinking about trying this out, they could do so without any, you know, sort of cost incurred, uh, incurred to their facility. Um, and what's interesting, so um, these days we still are continuing that. So we're, you know, five and a half 
years in, and we are still continuing the Freedom Facilities Naloxone Initiative, now being um, supported by CARA funds. And um, it's to ensure it lasts as long as possible, we do encourage that to go to purchasing the nasal spray, um, which is the preferred option when clinically appropriate, just to um, be good stewards of, of uh, federal funds. And so to Corey's question about the um, policies and, and things, what's interesting is this CARA Section 915 elimination of copayment requirements, this uh, it exempts copays for naloxone as well as training um, on naloxone. And this stems actually from a 2015 um, uh, legislative proposal that we pulled together that basically ended up getting adopted into CARA. So this is one example of how, you know, we had this legislative proposal to, um, to try to do this, and it actually ended up translating into law, which was very exciting. And so the other thing that we knew is that we needed uh, policy guidance um, and clinical guidance, and that's where this last recommendations for issuing the lockdown comes in. And so it was most recently updated in September, um, but um, the recommendations have been pretty uh, th these main ones consistent since the inception, which is basically, um, you'll see if, if you have any people who are clinicians, um, essentially we did this to be as broad as possible that, you know, basically you offer naloxone to veterans prescribed or using opioids who are at increased risk um, or whose provider deems based on their clinical judgment that the veteran has an indication. And so if you know anything about um, <laughs> kind of uh, clinical practice, this basically is, is give the provider um, the opportunity to give naloxone to whoever they think would benefit from it, which is really awesome. Um, so again, this has been um, pretty consistent since the inception of the program in 2014. This is an example of what I was mentioning. Uh, when we first started the program, there were no national uh, vendors that could give us naloxone kits. So we created these kits ourselves, and so um, those are the, on the top are the two, the um, intranasal and intramuscular formulations that we pulled together, and as soon as the um, ones on the bottom were available, we added them to our national formulary and kind of switched them out. Next slide shows all the technical assistance we have to really help support OEND implementation. We have some videos, if you guys want to check them out on YouTube. And we actually have accredited TMS training available to outside providers on train.org. So you can also check that out. It gets really high ratings. Um, so um, people seem to really like that one. The next slide shows the um, VA academic detailing OEND SharePoint. Academic detailers have really been the backbone of our program. We kind of started at the same time, and it, it's one of their um, top and their number one campaigns is OEND. And so these are clinical pharmacists who are trained in, in trying to get providers to do evidence-based practices. And so this is, again, their number one campaign in VA. This is the one that providers um, get detailed on the most. And so you see these really nice materials that they've developed, and those are our videos. Um, what's nice about that is you can see on the bottom it says, um, these are like our patient ed brochures. They're available in both English and Spanish. And when it says order, it means the VA National Repository houses these. And any clinician or any VA employee across the entire system can get these ordered and stocked in their clinics for free. So um, academic detailing has really been um, amazing at funding these and ensuring that um, these are, uh, and it's amazing from an implementation perspective, these are the types of things that actually um, are barriers to implementation. People don't even have the ability to, you know, have these types of copies available. It seems very simple, but um, having this has been really helpful. Next slide shows the various different dashboards and data resources we've made available to all VA staff to help identify patients at risk. Um, look at priority panels, so providers, and um, who may have the most number of patients who could benefit from OEND. We have trend reports, um, just lots of different um, ways to leverage our electronic health system to really help improve care for veterans. So the next slide is um, basically when I talk to the field about um, how OEND is simple, it, it, it literally can be done in a few minutes with a trifold brochure, and that would cover all the three aspects that I mentioned in the OE part of OEND, which is prevention, recognition, and response. So on this first page, what you see is on the left-hand side, choose before you use. This is all the prevention information, and the information in the middle, you're at higher risk when these things happen. 
And then um, if you go to the next slide, this is the information on how to recognize and respond to an overdose. So left-hand side is signs of an overdose. Right-hand side is responding to an overdose. And then we have that same brochure tailored to opioid safety, which are for patients prescribed opioids. So similar uh, framework, we have prevention information on the front side. Next slide shows the same recognition and response. The next slide after that shows BHA naloxone distribution to date. Again, um, from an implementation perspective, you think about scaling nationally. The fact that we have almost 215,000 veterans in less uh, than six years with naloxone is, I think, pretty remarkable. We have a lot more we need to do. But if you think about a brand new clinical practice nobody was trained in, there were questions about the evidence base particularly for patients prescribed opioids. The fact that we have, you know, hit over 200,000 veterans, um, we're really proud of that, and every facility has, has done this. Um, and so we're, we, again, have a lot more work to do, but um, this is pretty remarkable considering um, it's a brand new clinical practice. Next slide is OND national trends. You see that we um, have uh, pretty linear increases in um, naloxone distribution in terms of fills, prescribers, and um, also with regards to getting naloxone to some of our high-risk groups. So um, we continue to monitor this to make sure that that line keeps going up. We can think about implementation as an S-shaped curve. We still are very early on in implementation, so um, we anticipate this will kind of keep going up in this um, way uh, for a while. Next slide really shows how, from the outset, our focus which again, when we first started, a lot of the evidence was really among patients with opiate use disorders, um, but we also from the outset have really focused on patients prescribed opioids. Um, a CDC MMWR came out a few months ago that said that um, they looked at community pharmacy data and found that there was one naloxone prescription for every 69 high-dose opioid prescriptions. In VA, that number is one in five. So I think our attention to this um, again, lots more to do, but, um, you know, we're, we always kind of give ourselves a hard time. Like, we, we think that number should be lower, but um, it still is pretty remarkable when you think about it in, in the context of uh, external prescribing. So the next set of slides are really talking about key implementation considerations. So, yeah, provider education, patient identification, patient education, and post-overdose care. Post-overdose care, I'd love to hear your guys' feedback on this. This is one of our new things we're really trying to figure out how best to address. Um, we know that there's data suggesting, you know, one in ten in individuals that have an overdose event will die within two years. So we're really trying to make sure we put that on our radar. The next slide really shows um, provider education, really the impact of academic detailing and how um, that's been helpful in getting us to scale up. We have a ton of um, web-based training, national calls, in-person training, so lots of ways we educate providers. The next slide, you can go into the next one after that one. Um, these are uh, ways in which we identify patients, so we have an OND risk dashboard. This is important when it kind of has patients um, by reassured risk class, as well as um, you see opioid pharmacotherapy people by um, opioids plus benzos. This is showing just national numbers, but what's good about this is that you can drill down to the facility level, and uh, it will provide a list of patients who haven't gotten naloxone, so patients with no fill, that number would be hyperlinked, and it could actually generate a report that would help you identify those patients and get them um, and reach out to them to get them naloxone. So that's been used a lot in um, QI, uh, a lot of pharmacy resident projects and such. I'm the lead author on the VA stratification tool for opioid risk mitigation, um, the paper that came out, and I should have put in a reference, but um, this is really trying to transform care among patients prescribed opioids. And what this does, it's similar to Reassort, if you guys are familiar, but it's a way in which uh, we leverage VA's electronic health record data to identify patients at greatest risk of overdose and so um, and suicide. It's overdose and suicide related events among patients prescribed opioids. So what's I think important about this, there's a lot of ways in which we identify patients at risk, but this tool actually shows them what risk mitigation strategies have been employed to help, with, you know, if there aren't check boxes, then people can do that. And also it includes non-pharmacological um, pain treatment. Again, opportunities to really help um, mitigate risk for um, patients prescribed opioids. So it's really a snapshot. You can click on it and get this whole list of you know, over 50 risk factors um, that put patients at risk in a, in a nice little snapshot of that and what you can do to kind of help address that risk. 
Next slide is the opioid therapy risk report, which is another way um, in which providers can identify patients who might benefit from naloxone. Next slide shows the patient um, detail report. That first one was a panel management tool. Next slide is a clinic huddle tool that also allows providers to basically, um, when they can look at their panels or people coming in that day or that week, and they can identify people who, um, you can see that consider naloxone. They can ad identify patients who might benefit from naloxone there. So next slide is patient education. I wanted to provide you just a, a few examples of how patient education has been employed. So there's been some, again, targeted outreach using some of our dashboards, and then um, also ways in which people have been increasing awareness and also um, different educational efforts. So there's these really cool e-boards that people have um, developed in San Diego, which shows just to increase awareness about opioid overdose and such. Um, so next slide is talking again about post-overdose care. So this is something just for folks, I, don't, I know many of you aren't clinicians, so I won't belabor it, but if you're working in any sort of system, I, and I think this probably relates to just in general, I think, um, you think about Boston or Massachusetts and what they're doing, I think they're really at the forefront of really leveraging all the different databases um, to really try to help identify individuals who, you know, have had an overdose event. So I really feel like they're probably a great model. Um, but even just within our VA system, there's so many different ways and systems where these types of events, overdose events, get reported. And so um, one of the things I just want to highlight is we are really trying to leverage our national EHR to help with identifying and documenting these overdose and naloxone use events. And so um, these are reports that, again, um, we're using nationally to help um, not only just identify and document it, but also help to improve care post-overdose because a lot of clinicians don't necessarily get a lot of training in how um, to, to improve care post-overdose and what are some of the risk factors and things they can focus on. So the next slide really shows how we have put in place ways in which to make sure this is highlighted. So the idea is that if a provider, let's say a patient comes into the ED, it's not their treatment provider, but, um, and so they can't really make any changes to the patient's treatment plan, it generates a cover sheet reminder if the patient's treatment provider does not complete, you know, these sections, because for us, what should happen is if there's ever an overdose among a veteran, something needs to happen with regards to their treatment. So this is one way in which we're trying to make sure that happens so that if this doesn't get checked, that it, it's on the patient's, um, you know, medical record on the cover sheet saying, you know, overdose event um, and that it needs to be completed. So the next slide is um, healthcare considerations. Uh, OED is really you know, just one tool, not a panacea. It's more about that. You can use it to do so many things, talk about um, so many things with patients. You can really use it in a patient-centered way. Um, and there's lots of levers you can use to really help implement this. Um, really key components there are, you know, just helping identify patients as well as providing patient and provider education. Um, the big thing we're really trying to do these upcoming years is really help integrate it. So that one thing, you know, obviously OED is uh, life-saving. Um, but we talk about Matt as both life-saving and life-transforming. So the more we can start linking these two and offering, the better. And so, um, again, also focusing on post-overdose care at the critical juncture and a, a, an opportunity for us to really help with this. And um, really considering comorbidities and any history of opioid use, oftentimes we'll hear from folks, especially with the storm rollout, oh, well, my patient's on tramadol or my patient is on um, low dose, you know, opioids. So why, you know, why are on this list? And, and that's, I think, a whole different conversation. But what we know is that at least in most risk models that I've seen, it's not about the opioid. There's so many things about the patient's history um, and previous adverse events that really help with identifying those who are going to be at greatest risk. So even if you no longer have that opioid on board, you still have a person that has a complex clinical case presentation. They have um, substance use disorders, alcohol. They had previous suicide or uh, other types of events. So the idea is that it's, you know, kind of moving beyond just opioids to really help identify patients who are at risk, which is, I think, like I said, counterintuitive, a whole different talk, but something that we really at NBA are really pushing for people to understand. Because it's not just like, oh, you no longer prescribe the opioid and they're fine. That's not how it works. Um, so uh, lastly, we have a VHA rapid naloxone initiative, which is equipping um, 
VA police, as well as AED cabinets with naloxone. We have uh, worked with the Joint Commission and gotten feedback on that. So if you have any questions, happy to answer that at the end. And that was my 20 minutes, Corey. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Elizabeth. You did you did fantastic. You did fantastic. That was that was incredibly interesting. So now we're going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Ray. Let me get started here. I'm going to be talking about some community engaged research that I've done around this recent overdose epidemic, um, and really how this research has been guided by some early uh, interactions I had with harm reduction agencies, specifically um, the Chicago Recovery Alliance. I'll tell you that right now I'm at uh, Wayne State University, as Corey mentioned. I'm the director of the Center for Behavioral Health and Justice. So what we have there is um, about 30 community-engaged researchers that are focused on mental health and substance abuse, and then particularly where these populations intersect with criminal legal systems. Um, our research focuses on sometimes we're focused on evaluating innovative practices that community partners may be doing. But more often than not, it's, it's implementing uh, evidence-based practices, um, focusing on uh, getting them implemented to fidelity, evaluating the outcomes of that implementation. So we're in about 20 counties now, actually, in Michigan, and we have a couple of key initiatives that you see there, the Stepping Up Initiative, the Jail Diversion Initiative, uh, MyRep, which is a peer recovery coach initiative. And, and as we go through this talk, and I'll conclude, I'll talk about our most recent initiative, which is um, called the Opioid Treatment Ecosystem. And that's a, about implementing MOUD um, in county jails. So I got started in this uh, uh, line of research back in the early 2000s. Uh, my my uh, brother had a non-fatal overdose from heroin. I became very interested in the stigma around drug use and particularly around uh, heroin use. I did some work in Chicago with uh, Kathy Kane Willis, who was at uh, Roosevelt University uh, Greg Scott um, at DePaul University, and, and Greg um, ended up working with the Chicago Recovery Alliance and got me onto a very interesting project there where we were um, collecting death certificates and mapping out where overdose deaths were occurring to advise um, where the where the syringe services um, may, might want to deploy. And so um, this was just a really interesting project where I learned a lot about death certificates. And really, um, for anybody that's in this area, you often know death certificates are not nearly as informative as toxicology results. So I became very interested in this um, you know, area of research, and I went on to go get my PhD at North Carolina State in sociology. All my advisors told me um, this is not an interesting area. You shouldn't focus on opioids. And I did like any good grad student would do, and I just uh, learned what I could during those years. And I ended up focusing quite a bit on mental health and law um, but when I got my first tenure track job, which was at um, Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis, uh, in Indiana, the very first community partner that I reached out to um, and, uh, before I even moved there in 2011 was the county coroner, uh, Elfie Ballou. And I contacted Elfie, told her about some of the work that I had done in Chicago and how um, important these data were. And so she and I set up um, a real-time data collection system. So every single time an accidental drug overdose death would occur, um, and we started this in around 2012, uh, went back and got the data from 2010 and 11, which were paper copies, and we would put all of this into a database. Um, and at the time, you know, we were really interested in tracking, um, you know, the sort of shift from prescription opioids to um, heroin. And it was in the summer of 2014 where the individual who manages this particular database, we would have these monthly phone calls asking me if I had ever heard of this drug called fentanyl. And I hadn't. Uh, we looked it up and we thought, oh, is this, could this be um, these fentanyl patches? Um, and what we ended up seeing was that in, in a very specific date, fentanyl effectively hit uh, Marion County, Indianapolis. And uh, you can see in this figure here, um, that top, uh, those top bit of bubbles are when um, that line is when we started to first see the, the rapid detection of fentanyl. And it started to appear in, in all sorts of um, overdose deaths. And so we did some interesting work on modeling um, where it was occurring, who it was occurring, um, uh, what populations it was occurring. And then also, you know, we really wanted to make the point that this was not prescription fentanyl. Um, that this was illicit fentanyl. And so we were able to show the sort of trends of detection amongst uh, fentanyl and overdose deaths were mirrored by the drug seizures of uh, the Indianapolis Metropolitan Police Department. 
So it kind of became a very interesting uh, surveillance tool um, for the community stakeholders there in Indiana. And when I would go around and present um, the data, people would often say to me, you know, why do your numbers appear different than the CDC numbers? Your numbers seem to be higher uh, of overdose, opioid-related overdose deaths. And so you may or may not know this, but um, in the U.S., there are certain states based on the way that the medical examiners and the death investigations are set up have very high rates of unspecified overdose deaths. Um, Indiana usually was ranked in the top five. Sometimes it was the third. And so what this is is that somebody has the either medical examiner or coroner, depending on the state, has determined that it is an uh, accidental drug overdose death, but they didn't specify the very specific, the drug um, that was the cause of that death, the substance that was the cause of that death. So what we did <clears throat> is we went through, since we had been collecting all these toxicology data, we linked it up to the CDC ICD codes. And what you can see there is that that top bar of those white um, bars there are the unspecified overdose deaths in Marion County. And we went through all those unspecified overdose deaths to see how many of them contained opioids that would have been at the threshold of a detectable level that should have been noted in the death certificate. And you can see there are 86% of those unspecified overdose deaths um, contained in, in uh, opioid. And it wasn't, you know, prescription opioids. It was, it was heroin. It was fentanyl. It was a range of different opioid substances that really just were not being um, captured well on these death certificates. And so we still do a lot of work with the state of Indiana to figure out how to um, um, adjust for this undercounting and, and some pretty interesting work there. But I think one other thing that the death certificate and the toxicology results were able to um, illustrate is, and for, for those of you that don't know, I always think this is something really important to know in this space on, on the, the, the overdose epidemic, is that there's really been three distinct waves here. And if you could see um, this going back further in time, you would see that prescription opioid line continuing to increase in the five or 10 years before that. But then in that wave two is when we saw that shift from prescriptions to heroin. And then wave three um, is very much being driven by fentanyl still. Um, and there's a fourth wave, which I'll touch on here in a second, um, that people refer to uh, that uh, the, the stimulants. So with this particular um, data set, it kind of launched into um, three different areas of research. Um, and I'll kind of touch on those. Uh, some data linkage efforts, some efforts around um, uh, drug testing technologies, and then some work around MOUD in prison or in jail settings right now. So with those death investigation, uh, with the toxicology data, what we ended up doing was linking them. And we, we now do this in real time. So when death certificates come in, we're able to get um, EMS records on that person. We get the jail and arrest records, and we get the prescription drug monitoring uh, data as well. We're in the process of linking these up to other healthcare data uh, at the county level again. So this is for Marion County, Indiana. And in some ways, this, sort of, this, this data linkage allowed us to see, well, where would a good intervention points have been? Uh, but it also allowed us to look um, prospectively sometimes. So, for example, to say how many people that, you know, had an, uh, naloxone administered by EMS um, went on to die or how many people that left jail went on to die. So um, we ended up doing this. The, one of the studies, for example, that we did was looking at uh, EMS uses of naloxone and then subsequent um, death, if there was subsequent death. And this was a really interesting project. I'll tell you, it came out of, um, we were doing trainings with law enforcement on naloxone. And one of the things that the, the cops would say is, we're sick of giving it to the same people over and over again. And we were actually using their data collection system to track who they were giving it to, like when they were using it. And, you know, we could see there was only, you know, less than, I think it was 6% of the uses were multiple uses, so that only 6% of the people ever had it used more than once. And we thought this is a really interesting empirical question, knowing that the vast majority of naloxone is administered by EMS, not law enforcement. How many people have uh, multiple resuscitations amongst um, uh, EMS? So what we found is that 87% uh, only had one naloxone administration. This is over a six-year period. 13% of people um, did have a repeat event, um, and that those people that did have a repeat event, they were much more likely to die at follow-up. Uh, and then 10% of those who received naloxone during the 16 or during the six-year period um, had died at follow-up. And I think one of the interesting things there, though, is that 
um, one third of those individuals died of an accidental drug overdose death. About two thirds, uh, they were older adults. The average age was 69 years old, um, and they were dying of dementia. You know, other other complications that were not accidental drug related deaths. But still, 79% of the folks that received naloxone from EMS um, didn't go on to die, did not go on to have an additional administration. So this was kind of an example of us looking at the EMS data going forward um, and that data linkage. Another uh, project, which we're actually still in the process now, so we only have this more recently for 2016 to 2017, but we link up the prescription drug monitoring data. And so you can see here um, about a, a little less than half of people had a PDMP record 38% had an opioid um, analgesic prescribed to them. And of those, 42% also had a benzodiazepine prescribed. But, uh, and the people that had, um, had the PDMP record, they tended to, be, um, uh, tended to be more likely to be females than males. But we're also now in the process of actually mapping the toxicology results to the uh, PDMP data so we can see if you actually died from a drug that was legally prescribed to you. And um, probably not surprising to folks here, but uh, not very many people die of an accidental drug overdose death of a drug that was legally prescribed to them. <laughs> the other area of research that this uh, took us into were drug testing technologies. So as you may or may not know, nearly all, you know, 90% of drug overdose deaths are poly drug overdose deaths. So we don't just find one drug in there, we find quite a few drugs, uh, quite a few substances. And so, we struggled for quite some time for like, how do we visualize this, this poly drug, um, these poly drug overdose deaths so that we can look at patterns. And so what we ended up doing was using a social network analysis where we're actually looking at the networks of the drugs, the poly drug deaths. And so if you look at this um, image here, what you see is that, you, you know, you probably have heard there's this increase in stimulant related deaths, there's increase in, um, uh, uh, deaths amongst African Americans in the U.S. And so you can see there that while cocaine deaths um, the, uh, are increasing, those deaths that had cocaine were also very likely to have had fentanyl um, and that that's increased over time. And if you were to look back, you know, we have a publication on this where, uh, you know, back in 2010, you see a very strong connection between those prescription opioids and benzodiazepines amongst um, white decedents. So it allowed us to look at these poly drug overdose deaths in a new way and really got us thinking then about, well, okay, if this, if this is, um, if the possibility that uh, cocaine is, is somehow being adulterated with fentanyl, um, you know, that, does that create opportunities for drug testing technologies? And so we have partnered with um, some chemists out of Notre Dame, and these chemists have developed um, a device called the ID pad. And this ID pad, it's a piece of paper um, it's very cheap to produce. You put it in water and within three minutes it fills up and it can show you what's in the substance. You kind of, uh, across the top of the card there, you rub your substance across the top of the card, put it in water and then it shows you what's in there. Um, and so it's a very interesting, it, it, it picks up on multiple substances. So it could pick up on fentanyl and methamphetamine and cocaine and, and multiple things. It's quite difficult to read um, and it's also, it needs to be validated. And so the card had been used in previous settings, so it's been used in other countries to test for, you know, poison milk, um, uh, for poisons and um, uh, other substances, but this is the first time it's been uh, attempted to be used for, um, you know, quote unquote street drugs. And so what we needed to do was acquire um, illicit substances that were adulterated, that had been mixing agents were in them, they were, you know, street level drugs. And so we ended up getting uh, a license from the DEA. And what we do is at the scene of all of those death investigations that occur now, the coroners collect all of the drugs that are at that scene. They put them into tubs, they put them into different, you know, baggies, things like that. And then we send them to Notre Dame. Notre Dame runs them on the ID pad and they run them on this mass spectrometer and that allows them to um, sort of validate the ID pad and, and modify it as needed. So in, in the interesting research question that's come out of this then is um, when we do find an accidental drug overdose death that contains, for example, cocaine and fentanyl, um, we have photos and we have, um, you know, gold standard mass spectrometers from all the substances that are detected at that scene 
And so the kind of challenge that I put out there is, well, okay, show me the adulterated cocaine uh, so that we can, you know, we can inform the harm reduction agencies, the syringe services. If there's some pill out there that has both cocaine and fentanyl in it, what does that pill look like? What does the encasing look like? And to date, um, we have not found any. We have not found any substances where it was both cocaine and fentanyl in the same substance. Instead, what we tend to find at the scene is both cocaine and fentanyl, suggesting that there may be some uh, co-using occurring. So um, it's kind of morphed into its own project and, and, and it's evolving on its own here. And then the third uh, project that I wanted to touch on there was um, the implementation of medications for opioid use disorder uh, in correctional settings. And so as you all you know, may or may not know, um, uh, the, the, the um, per persons with opioid use disorder are disproportionately represented in, across criminal legal systems. And um, very few of them are likely to get um, to receive any treatment, um, let alone have the option of receiving all three treatments. And um, as a result of the you know, rapid um, withdrawal, um, the, these folks are very, at a very high risk of death post-release, right? And so going back to that data linking project, when I was in Indianapolis, we would be able to link up those toxicology data with the arrest records. And we would see over time, uh, it started out at about 25%, and over time it would increase to 35%. 35%, over a third of individuals, that died of an accidental drug overdose death in that county were in the exact same space in that year, at some point in that year prior to their death. Uh, and that was that county jail. And we would go there, I would go there, I would really try and push them to um, uh, implement uh, MOUD services. I would uh, try and get them to uh, you know, do naloxone uh, on exit and it just you know, really never went anywhere. And it was a very frustrating um, endeavor for me. So the um, offer with Wayne State, one of the really enticing parts of this offer uh, was that there was a project that was kicking off um, called what they were calling the Opioid Treatment Ecosystem. And what it was was that this group of individuals called the uh, Michigan Opioid Partnership, it was a public-private uh, partnership between the state and uh, several foundations, they gave uh, the funds to uh, Wayne State and they allowed Wayne State to um, allow those funds to be distributed to county jails that would implement uh, medications for opioid use disorder. But the very exciting part of this for me was that we could set the bar for what that implementation um, would look like so, um, to, before we would release funds. And so to us, uh, implementation, in order to receive these funds, um, you need to implement all three forms of uh, medication. You need to screen individuals, all individuals that are coming into the jail for potential opioid use disorder, and you need to develop a continuum of care uh, for those folks uh, upon release so that they can maintain that treatment. And we had many locations tell us that they didn't want to do it. We had many locations tell us that they knew that they may get sued and that they would wait and they didn't care. Uh, but we were able to um, move with um, at least four of them. Uh, we're moving into two others um, here relatively soon. And I think having, and so having those funds <laughs> was a really uh, way to get people motivated to act. But also we ended up hiring somebody that had worked, a social worker that had worked in these correctional settings for 30 years. And so he has been um, doing this work for a long time. And what we found is that a lot of these locations, it's really just, it's stigma, it's, um, it's, it's uh, attitudes, negative attitudes against um, uh, persons who use drugs, and it's really just sometimes a lack of knowledge. And so having uh, Matt be on this has been really beneficial. And I should stress, though, that one thing, and this is something that I've tried to bring to this project, is I really want to avoid our focus just being getting MAT or MOUD in, in jails. So what we're trying to do with these counties as well is identify um, interventions that they could implement prior to incarceration. So for example, in some of these counties when there's a non-fatal overdose that police um, are involved in, then they can refer that person um, to harm reduction services, to treatment services. And so a couple of counties are starting to adopt that. 
Later this spring, we'll have a fairly large summit where we're hoping to uh, push that out to other counties as well so that we're trying to build this ecosystem to divert for people from before they would even get into these jails to, to receive this um, type of treatment. But an interesting part of this project is that, you know, we're using this EPIS implementation framework to kind of guide our technical assistance because much as we talk about with harm reduction with individuals, you know, we're really trying to meet these jails and these correctional settings at where they're at. Some of them are just not ready to implement. Um, they're into exploring the idea. They're into preparing for the idea. So for those uh, counties that are exploring it, that are preparing, we're doing a needs assessment. We're doing process maps with them, and we're really trying to provide them technical assistance toward um, sustainability or towards implementation. For those that are implemented, uh, implementing the full range, um, what we're doing there is we're working more towards uh, trying to obtain funding for them. Um, and also trying to get them to be able to sustain this, um, uh, this evidence-based practice in these settings. And in, 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 you know, from my perspective, and I think this is an empirical question that as we move forward in this, and it'll take us some time to answer this, but um, I believe having the financial resources is important um, to get this implemented, but sustainability is gonna be all about um, not just attitudinal changes and not just increasing knowledge, but really changing practices in those settings, uh, in those counties, um, so that folks aren't just um, having these treatments come through the correctional system. So that's all I have. I don't know if I was under or over, but um, I'll turn it over now. Okay. Hi there. Um, my name is Marita Riley. So as Corey mentioned, I'm a staff attorney at Vermont Legal Aid, and I've been here since 2016. Um, I'm very excited to present today and really um, even more excited to be speaking about this project that's uh, both a new project and an old one for me. Um, I've been involved with it for a couple of years, but it's really in, in its nascent second iteration, um, but very, very excited to present on it nonetheless. Um, and it's called Vermont's Legal Advocacy in, Re in Recovery Services Project. Um, so the Lairs Clinic, um, it's a medical legal partnership um, that's situated at two traditional treatment facilities in Vermont and at one um, really innovative harm reduction program um, that has been a needle exchange program for over two decades um, and has recently started a low barrier buprenorphine clinic. Um, the low barrier program really deserves its own PowerPoint entirely, um, and hopefully they will at some point um, do their own presentation for all of you because um, the leadership there is incredible and, and the services they're providing to folks um, in Vermont is, is really uh, unprecedented. Um, but I'll just say a few things about it. Um, so the low barrier program, as you, as you could likely imagine, is aimed at working with clients uh, who struggle in our traditional treatment system. It's called the hub and spoke system, and I'll get to that in a minute. Um, and typically those, um, it's, um, typically those uh, who either cannot get into treatment facilities or are barred from returning due to non-compliance issue, uh, issues are those folks who um, go into low barrier program. And a lot of those non-compliance issues are caused by a host of factors like homelessness and severe mental health issues, repeated reincarceration, um, continued use of substances, or you know, sort of under the umbrella of behavioral issues. Um, as I mentioned, Safe Recovery has been doing needle exchange work for 20 years. Um, they were the first in the state to distribute naloxone, um, and they've been providing HIV and Hep C testing. Um, they've also, most importantly. Um, or, or as importantly, um, have been developing trusting uh, relationships with people who use drugs all across the state of Vermont. Um, even though they're located only in Chittenden County, um, up north in Burlington, um, their data suggests that they've really touched over 70% of the population in Vermont who uses drugs. Um, and they've, for, for a very long time, been supporting folks um, getting into treatment, advocating for them, making sure they're on wait lists, and even continuing to support and advocate for them while they're in treatment. Um, and so for the last several years, um, they've really just had sort of a skeleton staff, a couple of social workers and caseworkers, 
Um, they happen to be some of the most competent uh, caseworkers and social workers, but still um, definitely did not have enough staff to, to address the need in Vermont. Um, but today they have three medical doctors prescribing buprenorphine. Um, there's also a psychiatrist, several social workers, and a researcher. Um, and this is, as their director says, the unburnable bridge to treatment. Um, so they'll take on folks, as I mentioned, who just struggle to stay in the traditional treatment system. Um, and the idea is um, they'll provide that necessary treatment um, until the person is able to get into the regular treatment system. And I think there's um, the realization that for some folks that, that may not be um, a quick process. Um, so the Lair's mission, um, obviously I think very, very highly of our, our partners, um, certainly the hubs, um, but, but also this low barrier clinic. Um, but the Lair's mission is to address the health harming legal needs or the social determinants of health facing low income Vermonters with substance use disorder by providing the necessary civil legal interventions. Um, so the social determinants of health um, Y'all are probably familiar with that term. They're really the social and economic conditions that impact health outcomes. Um, and the way that the determinants, um, you know, are distributed across our, our population has um, everything to do with our laws and our public policies. Um, as the World Health Organization has said, um, there's an, this unequal distribution of health damaging experiences is not in any sense a natural phenomenon, but is the result of a toxic combination of poor social policies, unfair economic arrangements, where the already well off and healthy become even richer and the poor who are already more likely to be, be ill become even poorer and bad politics. Um, so addressing the health harming legal needs, this perspective really considers that the social determinants of health are uh, caused by systems issues and can be resolved using the law. Um, what we know is that people who use drugs in the United States have some of the most complicated layered health harming legal needs. Um, and I think that this is because of policy decisions we've made um, both in the state and, and also nationally. Um, to divest from good social programs uh, that we know work and um, to treat drug use as a crime and to focus our efforts and our funding on law enforcement responses. Um, what we see is that this results in a whole host of systems related traumas um, that, that compound over lifetimes. Um, so, you know, the, the common trajectory um, is, you know, folks are born in, in, um, into families that um, or homes that are unstable, um, their parents, um, you know, struggle with interpersonal violence and or incarceration. There's then foster care interventions, um, lack of academic and mental health support for the kids. Um, and this really puts the kid on a fast track for, um, you know, other systems involvement with um, criminal legal system. And, and with substance use disorder. Um, so by the time we meet them and they're using um, substances, there are so many health harming legal needs that they have um, from lack of housing to you know, driver's license issues to unemployment and criminal records and, and family law related issues. Um, all that to say, uh, because of the, the unique vulnerability of this population, we're very committed to um, helping to clear up some of these issues that, that keep people stuck on the margins um, and keep them in really unsafe situations. Um, so just uh, by way of context, the Vermont's opioid use disorder treatment system, um, you may have read about it. Um, there's been a lot of really good national press, um, and I think that's for very good reasons. Um, Vermont has a statewide coordinated system of medication-assisted treatment that's, um, that, that works pretty well. Um, each geographic region of the state has what's called a hub, um, and then there are all, all of these associated spokes. So the model was really implemented, or the implementation really started in 2013, um, and we now have 
eight hubs, not including the Department of Corrections, which I'll get to momentarily. Um, and these are opioid treatment programs um, for patients with opioid use disorder who are pre prescribed methadone and buprenorphine and or buprenorphine um, and who are new to treatment, um, considered clinically complex, um, and who are on methadone um, or who are on methadone. Um, and so each patient has a clinician uh, they're required to meet with regularly and at the outset. Um, as you all likely know, they go to the clinic daily. Um, and then there are 80-plus um, uh, spokes, and these are different office-based treatment programs. Um, so we, we boast over 250 prescribing, prescribing physicians in our small state. Um, and uh, these spokes are, are the um, treatment offices where patients uh, transition after they've stabilized in the hub. Um, there's a medication-assisted treatment team there, so there's a nurse and a counselor um, for every 100 patients, um, and they provide home, uh, health home services. Um, in theory, if and when the patient um, destabilizes and, and, and um, needs more uh, support or supervision, however the spoke terms it, um, they can be sent back um, to the hub to receive treatment there. So I alluded also to the fact that our Department of Corrections um, has a medication-assisted treatment program um, now. So I, um, we're really proud in Vermont um, of this new law change. Um, it was years and years and years in the making, obviously, as, as most um, important uh, legal changes are. Um, but the Department of Corrections is now required to provide medication-assisted treatment um, to all of the uh, people housed in their facilities um, who have a diagnosed substance use disorder. Um, and, you know, we're hearing – there were certainly some implementation issues at the outset, but we're hearing um, overall pretty, um, pretty good things um, with regard to compliance. So that's really a, a background um, and, and some context about where our uh, collaboration is situated. Um, and then a little bit about uh, Vermont Legal Aid and this program. So we're a non-LSE-funded legal aid organization. Um, and the, the program that we've started has its origins um, in a pilot that I had started um, during this two-year Poverty Law Fellowship I was part of um, from 2016 to 2018 after I finished law school. Um, and so the purpose of that um, pilot was to serve people with opioid uh, use disorder who have legal issues um, and to learn more about the opioid crisis in Vermont. And so the ultimate goal was figuring out whether there was some systemic work we could do to help improve the lives of people with opioid use disorder. Um, and there's been some systemic work, some, some law change um, that I can talk a bit about, um, especially with regard to criminal records reform. Um, but I think really one of the most significant conclusions we came up with is that um, medical legal partnerships specifically for this population um, is necessary. If we're going to um, seriously address the opioid crisis, um, then we have to change how we're providing uh, legal services um, to this group um, for very understandable reasons. Um, they might not find it straightforward to walk into the legal aid office um, and engage in, a, in, in the traditional way um, with a lawyer. Um, so after that fellowship, um, we had hired on an AmeriCorps Vista, she helped us collate our, our case data um, and do some qualitative follow-up and figure out um, where people were after our interventions and whether they helped. Um, and there was, um, I'm not bragging, I promise, but there was unanimous agreement that the legal services provided um, had very positive impacts on recovery. Um, and I don't think it's necessarily because of, of the quality of lawyering per se, um, but I, I think it is because the legal help, um, legal help generally is, is really out of reach for this population. Um, often the only lawyer they're interacting with is a defense attorney um, in, their, in their criminal cases. Um, 
So we ended up uh, presenting this collated data and all these wonderful graphics you'll see on the on this slide and, and some of the upcoming slides. Um, we presented it to our Department of Health here in Vermont, um, and they agreed that it was an important program that we should um, sort of pilot it again, um, this time with, with more rigorous um, data collection, um, and this time with, with uh, two attorneys instead of one, um, and with the um, intent to serve 200 clients, uh, you know, providing legal advice and assistance. Um, and so we commenced our clinic work in September of 2019, um, and my colleague who's um, staffing the clinic in the other county is, is still waiting on MOU stuff, but um, should be up and running soon. Um, so the funding comes from the SAMHSA um, opioid, state opioid response um, grant, um, and to our knowledge, we are the first substance use disorder specific MLP that um, is, it has access to funding. Um, and, you know, really our MLP, um, you know, we're able to access the funding because we're considered part of the wraparound services um, that Vermont has embraced um, for its, its patients involved in medication-assisted treatment, um, and we hope that that um, contemplation or consideration will continue, um, you know, in the springtime when we have negotiations uh, with the Department of Health. So um, our clinic work, um, we, this is um, work that primarily rests on um, good collaboration with our partners, with the healthcare professionals. Um, so, you know, the main um, uh, activities that we're engaged in um, start with training the healthcare partners to screen for legal needs, um, developing a referral process and providing substantive legal training for the healthcare partners. Um, we think that the referral process and the screening uh, gets better and is clearer and is easier for everyone um, when the clinicians and caseworkers have some sort of basic knowledge of the substantive legal issues. Um, we also are hopeful that we can continue our education um, in the, the medical uh, the medical sort of side of things. Um, obviously, we have some experience over the past couple of years, um, but you know, we think that they have um, a lot of knowledge uh, and information to share with us as well. And we think that can you know help make us better advocates for for our clients. So we um, we host the clinic hours. This is the sort of really the meeting people where they're at. So we're situated at the Needle Exchange Low Barrier Clinic uh, once every other week and then at the hubs um, once every other week. Um, and we are collaborating with um, the clinicians not just uh, to get those referrals in and to schedule the office hours, but also um, for some of the casework. It really, um, with populations who um, are homeless or are in and out of um, the facilities, uh, who may not have phones, um, who may, you know, be um, sort of overburdened with other responsibilities, um, sort of cobbling together employment, et cetera. Um, it's really important to, um, for us, um, it's made all the difference in the world to have clinicians and caseworkers who have trusted relationships with these clients um, so that if we're just sort of the annoying lawyer, um, they're not sort of falling off the map because um, the person that they really trust um, is, is sort of right there with them. Um, and we, you know, we don't take it personally um, if someone is uh, seemingly less engaged with us than we want them to be, um, just so long as we can obviously get the, the casework done. But we understand that um, there's a lot, there's been a lot of um, trust issues created uh, between our clients and the system. And in short, our clients are pretty distrustful. Um, and we do, we know that we represent the system. So, you know, we hope that as this um, clinic continues, um, we, like our partners um, can, like our partners have already done, can gain a reputation of being, um, you know, focused on the client's needs first and foremost, um, and that, that those engagements um, are, are are good and easy. Um, so the other, um, the last two activities we're engaged in is collecting the front end data um, 
about the cases and um, sort of where clients are at in their in their lives, um, and and the part that we're just starting um, to um, think about now is designing the follow-up instruments to, to understand our impact. Um, and while this might not be ready for negotiations in the spring, um, we're really looking to um, start having conversations with public health academics around, um, you know, how we should be basically um, to get assistance um, creating the, the necessary instruments to be measuring um, what we should be measuring. Um, so this um, I help categorization, um, and I should wrap up, which I can do very easily. Um, so this I help categorization really guides our case priorities in clinic, um, as as it's the issues in these areas that are most likely going to impact um, our clients' health and um, their ability to either stay in recovery or, um, you know, reduce their harm um, of uh, of using drugs and or get into a treatment program. Um, so, you know, be, I, I mentioned this before, but because of the ways in which substance use disorder is treated in the United States um, through law and policy, um, these categories are um, really rife with issues for most of our clients because, um, as you know, when people um, use illicit substances in the United States, they um, often lose everything. Um, so, you know, so many of our clients um, get involved in the criminal legal system, and then um, if it hasn't already happened at that point, um, so many of the opportunities for um, generating income or, or getting employment, um, getting into good housing, um, furthering their education just disappear, um, right? So we know they're, they're essentially blacklisted. Um, so as I had mentioned before, for many of my clients, we could really open three or four different legal cases um, so, you know, for some of them, we do, um, because there are several issues like housing and criminal records that need to be um, addressed, you know, pretty much simultaneously or, um, you know, uh, prior consumer debt and housing issues is, is a common one. Um, so just, um, you know, income, I'll give you sort of some uh, detail about the categories. So with income, we're primarily looking at public benefits. Um, with housing, we're looking at evictions and subsidy terminations, habitability issues. Um, and actually, I think I'm, I'll probably stop there because we have literally 10 minutes. Um, so we have a couple of um, demographic slides. Um, I mentioned this is, you know, an, in its new or nascent um, second iteration. Um, and so the numbers we've collected are absolutely preliminary and, and the analysis, uh, we've not done any analysis of outcomes because it'd be far too preemptive. Um, but, um, you know, one of the things that we're certainly interested in looking at, and we think the state will be interested in looking at, um, is, you know, in addition to reducing the harm for an individual person, um, our individual client, um, is there also a preventative component um, to the interventions we have for other people in the household? So, for example, if we're able, um, and that sort of um, gets at this, um, like looking at um, who's in the household. Um, for example, if we're able to help um, prevent against an eviction um, and, and there are kids in that household um, who, are, who then don't lose their housing, um, what does that mean for toxic stress and for ACEs and for subsequent um, drug use? Um, and the same thing for you know, getting parents um, back into the workforce or into education programs by clearing their record. Um, what can we measure the impact that that has on kids and can we make a real um, argument to um, funders, um, state, federal government uh, in the future that this is preventative work. Um, this, you know, if we can prevent traumas and we're ultimately preventing, um, you know, future substance use disorder. Um, so I think I have one more slide. Um, I've got a couple of stories that I think I'm going to skip because I, I think that um, you all sort of get the idea. Um, and then just talk really briefly about um, some of the systemic work. Um, so the specific nature of this MLP, you know, that it's focused on, on individuals with substance use disorder, I think puts us in a good position to continue um, engaging in systemic advocacy in Vermont um, that reduces harm uh, for this population. 
And we think in, in a crisis, in a fentanyl uh, an overdose crisis, um, we believe really will help save lives. Um, so we're, you know, because we're seeing in real time that the um, actual issues and gaps faced by this population um, in collaboration with our treatment partners, um, you know, are uniquely positioned to, to influence the law and policy change. Um, and some of those, uh, some of the legislative advocacy, for example, we've been working on is criminal record um, reform, um, also recovery residence legislation. Um, so the, the criminal record reform is really expanding the universe of crimes that can be expunged, uh, making the process easier. Um, right now, we're, we're sort of continuing that um, fight in the legislature, and we're trying to um, get get the fees and fines associated um, with expungement denials um, to, to become a non-issue, um, so to remove those. We're also advocating for um, better protections for folks who are in recovery residences. Um, there's a you know, huge problem in, in the state and around the country with uh, recovery residences denying people um, on the base denying people a spot in the recovery homes on the basis of medication-assisted treatment. Um, and there also has been, um, you know, insufficient scrutiny on the um, process that the sober home or recovery residence home operators have um, employed when attempting to terminate someone or, you know, what we would see as eviction, ev evict someone from that home. So we're working to create more robust protections around um, you know, that process and also codifying the anti-discrimination provisions we all know, which is um, medication-assisted treatment should never be the basis for denial um, from, from a home. We're also, um, you know, because the sort of war on drugs policies are at the root of so much of the harm our clients suffer and the ultimate legal issues they they come up against. Um, we are working on supporting a decriminalization of, of buprenorphine, buprenorphine possession bill. Um, and um, so I'll, I'll stop there. But if folks have questions specifically, um, you know, on the delivery with death resulting piece, um, or, you know, really any, any of what I mentioned, um, you can ask it in the five minutes you have for Q&A, or you can contact me. Um, I'm super thankful for your attention um, and, and look forward to connecting with you. Awesome. Um, thanks, Mairead, and, and everybody else. Um, that was all super interesting. So very, very quickly, I mean, you know, what I'm getting from all of the, the three presentations today is, you know, we've come a long way. Um, we still have a long way to go. You know, I, my, my first, job as a lawyer back in 2005 was doing something similar to what um, Mairead is doing now. And we had to shutter the, the place after two and a half years because we couldn't find anybody to fund it. Um, we just could not find any charitable organization and certainly no governmental agency that wanted to um, give us money to work with, um, you know, making air quotes, those people. Um, and now Mairead has got, you know, federal funds to do this work. So it's just, you know, we, we've come a long way. And same with the VHA, you know, I mean, uh, Dr. Oliver said they've, you know, helped over 200,000 veterans access naloxone in six years. I mean, that's, that's incredible. That's starting from nowhere. Um, you know, but we still have, uh, still have a long way to go. So I'm just, um, you know, really heartened uh, that there is, is so much good work going on. And I, I'm sure many of you on the on the webinar um, listening are, are doing great work as well. Um, so very briefly to address some of these questions. So um, someone asked roughly what percentage of states have legal barriers to naloxone access? Uh, I mean, the answer is that, you know, really the, the main barrier to naloxone access, in my opinion, comes at the federal level. It's, it's the fact that naloxone is a prescription medication. States have done you know, various things to try to make it easier to access. Um, but the, the, the main barrier is the fact that it's prescription medication, all the state level stuff flows from that. Uh, some states are doing a better job on that than others, but there's only so much that they can do. Um, happy to talk about that um, over email, over the phone, if you want to email me um, directly. Um, there's a question, uh, here, and I'm not sure, um, uh, Dr. Oliver, if you're still on, if you want to address this or if you can, but the question is, 
um, whether there's been any movement among Indian Health Service or the 638 clinics, which are the contracted uh, IHS clinics, um, it says regarding this issue, which I assume means access to naloxone, access to medications for opioid use disorder. Um, Elizabeth or, or any of the other panelists, do you, do you know anything about that? So I know I worked with IHS a long time ago, and I think it was more um, a specific location with a VA provider who went to IHS who wanted to kind of do what we were doing there. There, I, I reviewed a paper that, you know, I did look into some of this. IHS does have some um, uh, policy information up on the web, um, but I haven't worked as much with them as I have with, um, like, DOD, um, DOD and, and even the White House um, uh, off the National Drug Control Policy. Um, and also, I've reached out to and I'm connected with people at OPM, Office of Personnel Management. So I do feel that this is something that could be, you know, just general federal um, thing that we should be doing across our health services. So um, it's kind of reminding me that I should do more proactively. But um, to my knowledge, they are doing stuff. I don't know in the sense of whether or not it's decentralized as what is happening in VA. Okay, great, great, thank you. Um, and here's a question for, um, for Mairead specifically, and the question is just, how are you able to um, reach so many people across the state despite being located in only a few places and having a staff of really one or two folks? Right. Um, so, yeah, this, this isn't the Lairs Medical Legal Partnership that's had such a broad reach. Um, although we hope in the future we will because we'll be situated um, across the state. But this is the, the safe recovery uh, needle exchange and, and uh, Narcan um, distributor. Um, and I think they had, um, you know, such a uh, um, broad reach across the state because they um, built a lot of trust with the community of people who use drugs and they um, sort of, you know, sadly were for a while, I think the only shop in town that provided that sort of non-judgmental um, support um, and, and harm reduction services. Um, so where maybe some other services might, for example, um, require like a one for one, if you, if you take a needle, you have to bring back an old needle or, you know, other sort of um, policies or practices that uh, seem judgmental and really didn't um, focus on keeping the person alive and, and well to the extent possible, um, I think it just, you know, turned folks off. And when they learned, um, I think, honestly, it really was just like word of mouth, um, which sounds wild, but I think that's, you know, in part how a lot of things work in Vermont. Um, and, and so when um, folks who are in a really vulnerable situation um, hear from others um, who are vulnerable, um, that, you know, there's this place that you can trust, um, I think they just uh, really sort of took took each other's word for that. Um, I don't know if that's a you know satisfying answer, but that's I think that's really um, what it was. Yeah, no, that's that's really helpful. Thanks, um, Elizabeth. A question for you. I mean, it, one of the I mean, I would say again, I, I am incredibly impressed with with the work that that DHA has done. I mean. Yes, there's, there's more work to be done, you know, but the fact that, you know, one in five people who are at risk are getting an naloxone prescription, I think is great on, on so many levels, one in that it normalizes it, you know, um, and also that you're actually getting naloxone out to folks. But it also seems that, you know, you're able to do that partly because it's a very integrated system. Um, and it's a system that is, is quite hierarchical. It's a system that has relatively uncomplicated funding. Um, how what what lessons do you think you know are um, can folks in private practice, people in government work take away from your experience? You know what um, you know if you were to say you know here is one thing that, that we found that worked really well that we think you know can be moved relatively quickly to uh, other uh, care settings. Um, you know what what would you say? 
I'm going to quote uh, uh, Eliza Wheeler when she trained me, which is just do it. I mean, it, this isn't complicated. Like I said, it's not hard to get people on board. We're in an epidemic. Honestly, if you have a, I think there needs to be a champion. I think in any sort of implementation process, you need a champion. And I think if you have one person who in that facility, in that practice, or whoever it is, who's willing to take this on, that's where I think people need to start because that person's going to make the difference. And so I think it's just identifying someone who's willing to do it because honestly, all the things that we're talking about, yes, there are barriers, but you have a committed person and it can happen. So I don't know if that's like, it's just finding that champion to do all this because believe me, there's, if there's ocean, there's all these places and where people can go to get real help in how to do it. It's just, you need to have someone who has the will and that's willing to do the work to, to implement it. I don't know, is that, uh, is that kind of what you're looking answer. for? I, I mean, I yeah, think that's no, what it comes I mean, down I, to. I, I, was, I wasn't, yeah, no, I wasn't looking for any particular answer. I think that's a fantastic uh, answer, and I think that that's absolutely right. Um, and I would say if folks want to contact me or us at the clinic, we are also happy to try to connect you um, with folks who have done that or, or might be able to serve as mentors or, or to give Guidance yeah, I mean, for whatever barrier people um, are talking about, policy, you know, um, uh, formulary, I mean, there's an answer for all of these things. You just need to have somebody who's willing to just dig in and do it. And it's, again, it's the most rewarding work I think a person will ever do. It's, it's so amazing what this practice is. And I think that's why it's also taken off. Awesome, awesome. Uh, you know, we're about five minutes over, so I think I'm going to need uh, to to close the webinar now. Um, but again, please feel free kind of, to of email the second presenter because nobody asked him when he did. He's doing such amazing work, and if he's still on, I, I mean, I know lots of people are talking about fentanyl strips, but those cards are those available? Like, can people get those from just a harm reduction perspective? Yeah. So unfortunately. Uh, Brad had to uh, had to get off right at 2:30, but he, well, let's talk offline. The answer is, is kind of. <laughs> okay. Um, definitely agree that they are. Um, they definitely have a lot of comments. Yeah. Thanks. Sure, sure, sure. So again, um, you check out our other webinars. Uh, please feel free to email. Um, harm reduction at networkforphl.org with your legal or policy questions, or just, you know, um, we can help put you in touch with, with uh, clinicians, with social workers, with, you know, policymakers, whoever it is that you, um, you know, are, are hoping to talk to. We can we either know them or we know somebody who knows them, and we can, we can connect you up. And thanks again um, to all of our uh, presenters, and thanks to you all for for showing up uh, for our the first of a of a, a small series of of harm reduction legal and policy webinars.